Tech listeners, I'm your host this week, Justine Abson. This is the podcast where we tackle some of the trending topics, ideas and best practice in health and social care. This week, I'm speaking to Julie Rayner. Julie is Care, Quality and Governance and Compliance Director at Hallmark Care Homes. Julie's career has spanned 38 years so far. It's safe to say since qualifying as a registered nurse, she has well and truly been emerged into the world of health and social care. And I really can't wait to delve into her world of knowledge today. Julie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. So as I mentioned, obviously your career has spanned um, 38 years so far, which is absolutely fantastic. So let's delve a little bit into what your role as Care Quality Governance and Compliance Director at Hallmark involves. Absolutely. It's a big title, isn't it? It is a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's it's very, very varied. Um, you know, so I, I head up our internal compliance team, which includes our head of compliance, our health and safety manager. Um, so we are responsible for ensuring that the company is compliant with a whole range of legislation. So not just the health and social care legislation, but also data protection, health and safety, environmental health. Um, so that aspect of my role is 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 big it's very complex it's you know very very responsible um the other part of my role which is really interesting is the quality piece um you know so it's it's in that space that i can get involved in best practice and introducing innovations to hallmark as well um i get to work alongside some fantastic people both within hallmark and externally with them um, you know with partners out in in, um, in healthcare and in social care. So that's absolutely brilliant. Um, another part of my role is I am the infection control lead for Hallmark. So as you can imagine, that has been a very, very busy few years. <laughs> just a um, little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you, find, you find me today just um, updating our management of COVID policies again, because there is new guidance just being released. Um, so, so for the for the social care sector, COVID hasn't gone away. Um, you know, so we're still very busy with with that. So, you know, really very, very, very varied. Yeah, and, and just a little bit busy, I guess. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, you've also previously worked in more formal regulation roles, so CQC, Healthcare Commission. How did these skills help when you moved into the social care provider side of things? Oh, enormously, enormously. Um, you know, I think in my role, being responsible for governance and compliance, um, being able to understand and interpret legislation is is critical. You know, being able to find your, your way around regulations and to understand what the regulations are asking for. Um, being able to speak the same language as the regulator as well is is very important, um, and also knowing what what the regulator would be looking for, um, you know, when they do an inspection, um, being able to develop and establish internal compliance um, processes as well, you know, so that we can base our internal processes on what CQC in England and CIW in Wales would be looking for which puts us right on the front foot, um, you know, so we we can demonstrate to the regulators the incredible work we, we are doing within Hallmark. Yeah, and I, I guess as well, it kind of helps you, you sort of know the importance of that open, transparent communication with the regulators mm. as well, having come from yeah. that side of things. Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So since joining Hallmark in 2015, you've just mentioned about, you know, you're, you're updating the, the COVID policy at the moment. Um, you've actually <laughs> implemented over 70 policies, which just sounds incredible. Um, where do you start when it comes to these and, and how do you then look at those getting implemented across the, the Hallmark group? Well, that's a really good question. Um, how do I how do I find how do I discover what policies we need? I mean, obviously, in within regulations, um, there are certain policies you've got to have in place. Absolutely, um, you know, and it's very important to to base your policies on best practice. So the first step is research doing lots of research, you know, what are other people doing in this space? What are the other policies out there? Um, and then crafting that best practice um, into what is 
what is suitable for Hallmark and what we can operationalize in Hallmark as well. Um, and then the, the implementation of the policies is a variety of means. Um, you know, some policies you can you can just issue to the homes, you know, no problem at all. Other policies you'll want to you'll want to um, introduce with some training or with a webinar or with meetings, you know, so you need to think about the policy, the content of the policy, the complexity of the policy and how you can best um, embed that policy within the homes. Because, you know, it's no good just having a policy sat on a shelf if nobody is aware of the content or they aren't actually applying it um, in practice. Um, and what we also do within Hallmark is, you know, we it's important to be able to demonstrate to the, the regulator that your team are reading your policies. Um, but just to get people to sign their name on a piece of paper to say they've read a policy is basically just proving they can write their name on a piece of paper. So what we've done is we have created what we call policy awareness quizzes with nearly every single one of our policies. So when we implement the policy of the month process, which we have in all of our homes, the policy is given to the, the team, either at team meetings or emailed out to them or whatever the general manager feels is the best way to do it. And with the policy, they get the policy awareness quiz. So they sit down with the policy, because it's not a test, they sit mm. down with the policy, they complete the quiz um, as they're reading through the policy, and then they hand that quiz back to the general manager who checks that they have understood the policy, you know, from how they filled out the quiz. It's signed and it's kept in the P file. So when CQC, CIW visit and ask, how do we know that team members understand the policies? We can show them that team members have actually read the policy and we can demonstrate that through the completion of the, the policy awareness quizzes. That's a great idea. You know, you kind of think, because you sometimes read things, don't you? And you go, did that go in? But actually, I guess, yeah. you know, different people are different. But um, I kind of, I used to find it really helpful when I used to do tests and, and things like that at school. Even yes. I used to have to write revision notes down to then reread yep. and reread and rewrite it and things like that. So actually yeah. having that policy and then writing it as a quiz, I can, I can yeah. imagine it yeah. helps it sink in a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. And with my, you know, my with my work as the infection prevention and control lead for Hallmark, um, I I chair quarterly IPC forums with our IPC leads. And, you know, part of those forums um, on a regular basis, I will give them one of our infection control policies with the policy awareness quiz <laughs> and get them to complete it as well, just to make sure that our IPC leads have also got retained the most relevant and current information around infection control yeah especially when things are changing so much as well oh. um you know like you said it's not just like you implement a policy and you go right that one's done we, we never have to go back to it yes yeah and you know doing the original policies is one thing it's then keeping up to date with the reviews and you know making sure that you are horizon scanning and are on the front foot for when things do change you know within various areas yeah do um you mentioned about doing you know research around the you know the policies and things like that when it comes to best practice and, and what you're going to implement do you sort of um collaborate with like your peers and, and people like that as well when it comes to best practice mm, yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah i belong to a um a quality directors group um so this was a group that was created at the beginning of COVID, really, um, you know, to support each other within other care sec, you know, other care providers, um, and we we meet via Teams every month, um, and we've got a WhatsApp group, you know, so we it's that's a really good resource to to bounce ideas off people and to to see what other providers are doing as well, and just to share best practice between ourselves. Yeah, because it's really important, isn't it? You know, it's not a, a secretive type of place. Everybody just wants to provide exactly. really great care. So if somebody's doing yeah. something that's really good and is making a difference, then it could help anybody. Absolutely. 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 And, you know, if you if you if you don't reach out to peers, you know, and other provider groups, it can't be quite a lonely job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because I'm you know, you you 
I, I'm the only quality director within Hallmark, um, whereas lots of other care providers have got quality directors, you know, so pull on pull on other people's experiences really yeah and about like you, i think you mentioned as well bouncing ideas around it sometimes helps just to have yeah. those people yes. that are in the same field mm. as you as well and you bouncing those ideas around you know you might yeah. have something where you go i think this could work but is that right yeah. or how what's and, the best way to and, do it and, and certainly during covid it was invaluable you know because guidance would come out and you know we'd we talk to each other, interpret what the guidance was saying and, you know, what are you doing about that? What are you doing about that? And it just helped you to stay sane, really. Yeah, and like you said, you mentioned at the beginning, you've got to get into that language of, of how legisl legislation is, yeah. is spoken yes. as well. Yes. So obviously that understanding of it as well. Uh -huh. Absolutely, absolutely. So <clears throat> going back to the, the policies themselves a little bit, so how important are these for care providers and how do they help mm -hmm. to create the best quality of life for your residents across the Hallmark Group? I think they, they're critical because they are the things that lay out your stall. They are the things that set out what you as a provider of social care want to give to the people who've chosen to live in one of your care homes um you know so things like your your safeguarding policy um you know things like your um wound care policy you know all all of those all of those um important aspects of care if it's written down in a policy then your team can follow that. You've laid out your expectations. Your team know what they need to do. Um, you know, and you can measure then quality of care against your expectations. Um, you know, and certainly within our internal compliance processes, our internal compliance audit is set out in alignment with CQC and CIW expectations. But within there, we've also captured some of our specific um, standards as well. So that when we do an internal compliance audit within our homes, we are assessing them against the regulator's expectations, but also our expectations. But none of our expectations are unknown. Our expectations are all written down in our policies and procedures. So I think they're, you know, they're absolutely critical. They're the foundation on which your, your care delivery is built. Yeah, and they're not there to catch people out. They're not there for a test or like you mentioned, you know, they're there to, to kind of to yeah. create that, that best quality of yeah. life and do everything that I guess everybody who works within the care homes actually wants to deliver as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So one of my, one of my favourite things about Hallmark um, that I've seen is that residents can bring their dogs with them when they move into the home. And as a, as a dog owner myself, I can just imagine the heartbreak that some people must have if they have to ever leave their pet. So I think it's something incredibly special. What prompted the creation of this policy and what was involved in, in making that one happen? Creation was because I'm a dog lover as well. <laughs> um, but also, I, you know, I knew that I knew the positive impact that animals can have on people um you know not just people living in care homes but but anybody you know as a as a dog owner myself you know as you say you're a dog owner as well you know the comforts that can be given from having an animal and from you know time spent with that animal um you know and research did, has shown that stroking a dog or stroking a cat does reduce stress it reduces blood pressure um it encourages exercise as well, you know. So there were just so ma so many benefits associated with pet ownership, um, you know. And like you say, we are creating homes for people, and people's pets are their family as well. So you know, why wouldn't we? The the positive benefits outweigh any kind of, of risks that there could be you know and absolutely we are aware of the risks and you know every resident who wants to bring um a dog or a cat into or a budgie or whatever, <laughs> whatever else um, into a care home we would have to risk assess it um but you know in one of our homes we've got two dogs living in the home oh. two residents have brought in their, their dogs and what a difference that has made to 
the the quality of life not just of the residents who have the dogs you know who own the dogs um, but the team as well and and visitors and and other other residents as well you know you just go into the home and into the cafe you know, where they're usually sat um, <laughs> that's and where mine would be feel, sat <laughs> yes, yes yeah it just feels so you know so warm and um you know so inclusive it's lovely mm. and a, a lot of our team um you know can also and do also bring their their dogs into to work with them as well. Um, again, they're risk assessed. Um, you know, we make sure that they're not going to be a danger to anyone. Um, but again, it's it's incredible the difference the difference it's made. We've got one one home in Wales, um, and their little their the general manager her little dog's called Ted, and he's brilliant you know and there was a there was a lovely occasion where a, a resident was was poorly and was in the last few days of life um and ted never left the person's side mm. it was just so you know just so lovely and um, because this the resident had loved ted and had made such a fuss of ted that you know ted just needed and, and the comfort that ted brought that resident um you know in those final days uh, was was incredible you know and the family were just so 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 appreciative of that so yeah there's just so many hu- there's huge benefits associated with it absolutely I think like you said as well it's not just the resident themselves bringing their pet in it's the impact it'll have on all the other residents because yeah. you know like yeah, how absolutely. the majority of people you know just smile if they see a dog or a or cat or yes. and like you said yes. just having a little stroke or, or whatever it is yeah. it's yeah. it's that kind of feeling of yeah there's just it's almost endorphins isn't it there's just something in it that just makes yeah. people happy and, a, and another you know another one of our homes our lifestyle lead she brings her little dog in um Dougal and and residents are more inclined to go for a little walk around the garden if Dougal is coming with them yeah because it's you know going for a walk with a dog is you know is is kind of like a, a normal thing to do isn't it it's a usual thing to do it is and so, that's a massive thing to to get <clears throat> residents moving out oh, in the fresh air yeah, like you said even yes, if it's just yes. five ten minutes again i bet uh-huh. that makes a massive difference um to yeah. them themselves yeah well as you say you know going going outside getting exercise fresh air it has huge impact on falls risks on mental health on emotional health on appetite um, fluid intake you know it's just got so many so many positive so many positive implications yeah it's it's fantastic it is it's <laughs> when I saw it I was like oh it's just such a lovely lovely <laughs> thing because I, I just know the benefits of it myself so yeah to and I think for, for residents that are you know potentially are going into a home and have lost maybe like a loved one or something like that as well to know that you've still got that comfort of having your pet with you as well I can I can Absolutely. imagine being a, a yeah. big kind of yeah comfort to them as I say, you know, the family, aren't they? Yeah, they the absolutely family. are. So in 2021, <laughs> you developed an end of life care strategy in partnership with Marie Curie. Um, can you tell us a bit, a little bit more about this and, and why it was so important? Oh, right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and that has progressed. And I'll tell you a little bit about where we've where we're going with with that as Fantastic. well. Um, in, in Hallmark, we've always we've always provided excellent end of life care. But what I what I wanted to do is I wanted to to get some consistency across the company. Um, you know, other care providers will know that sometimes the well, a lot of the time, the support and help that you get around end of life care is very dependent on your local hospice. Um, so, you know. At that point in time, you know, we could have had different help and support training in Ipswich than we did in Merthyr, Titville in in Wales. So I came from the point of view is let's see if we can put together a a strategy that will enable us to get some consistency across the business. So um, luckily at that time, I was at a a conference and was talking to to somebody from Marie Curie, um, you know, and I was talking about them, about the end of life care we provide, the passion that I had for end of life care. And that was where the partnership started and established and grew. So throughout the, the entire two years of COVID, 
um, we were developing our end of life care strategy um, in six of our homes across England and Wales. Um, and the partnership that we had with Marie Curie was was fantastic, you know, in that they were providing training for us. Um, they were supporting our end of life leads with mentorship and coaching. They were attending our forum meetings and um, supporting us through action learning sets. Um, so it was it was a fantastic, fantastic two, two and a half years of that partnership. At the end of the two, two and a half years, I evaluated the, the outcomes of the strategy pilot and it was very, very positive. We then thought about how we were going to take that forward and what we are now working on, again, we are doing some co-production work with Marie Curie, um, is we are developing end-of-life care centres of excellence in two of our homes, one in England and one in Wales. So this has been something that was born out of the end-of-life care strategy pilot, um, but is taking the strategy to another level. So at our home in England, we are also developing an end-of-life care model for people who are living with dementia, um, which is an exciting piece of work because it's not something that's been done anywhere else. Um, you know, so us, we are specifically looking at how we can provide the best end of life care for people who are living with dementia. And the, um, the foundation of this is Namaste Care. Now, we have got two Namaste Care Centres of Excellence within Hallmark already. So we're taking Namaste Care, that's going to be the foundation of the end of life care for people who are living with dementia in this centre of excellence. Then we are adding to that um, talking mats, which is a, a communication method that enables people who are living with dementia who possibly cannot communicate effectively verbally to be able to communicate their wants and their needs and their desires. So we are incorporating talk and maths into the development of advanced care plans for people who are living with dementia so that they can input into that themselves. Um, in Hallmark, in our dementia um, strategy, we, we work within the, the census framework, which the census framework, that 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 state so that purports that if people are communicating unmet needs through their behaviors it is probably because a particular sense is not being met so we are using that census framework as a, <clears throat> a platform to relook at our advanced care plan so that our advanced care plan um actually delivers against each of the senses. So it's a it's a really exciting piece of work. Um, we're also doing some work with a charity called Dementia Carers Count, um, so that we can be providing high quality support to families of people who are living with dementia as they approach the end of their life as well. And that's just one little aspect of the Centre of Excellence because the other aspect is for residents who are not living with dementia. Um, and we are, we are doing some, as I say, we're doing some co-production work with Marie Curie around whole team training and developing a virtual training package for all of our team. Um, we're also talking to a hospice in Wales who are hopefully going to be supporting us with the centres of excellence going forward in terms of, again, shadowing opportunities and mentorship coaching. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so the, the, the initial piece of work around the, the strategy with Marie Curie has grown um, into this, you know, into this brilliant uh, piece of work that we're, we're currently, um, currently working on. That's fantastic to hear that because I think so many people, it'd be dead easy to go, right, okay, we've done that pilot and actually it worked really nicely and we're doing these things within our homes, but actually what you've now done is gone. Actually, we can take it to another level 
um, yes. and we can make yes. this even better for our residents and yeah, I think especially having that you know that <clears throat> sort of um the dementia side and the, the non-dementia side is yeah. I can imagine that offers a lot of comfort to the families you know especially if they've got families that don't live nearby you obviously get quite a lot of, of residents that might you know their families might live away and things like that but to know they're not only are they getting looked after properly whilst they live in the homes, but actually towards the end of life as well. Absolutely. It's yep. it's obviously an incredibly sad time when someone comes to the end of life, but it equally it's something that's going to happen to everybody. And to try and make that as positive as possible towards the end yes. just feels like yes. something really special. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it's, you know, it's another passion of mine, um, you know, to make sure that to make sure that everybody gets that level of care you know there's an old saying isn't there you know that end of life care you can only you only get the chance to do it once you know you can't go back and redo it so you've got to do your utmost to get it right for that person at that time you know and I think this is you know this is why the the, the dementia aspect is so important you know and the fact that we are able to use talking mats to be able to um, make sure that residents are involved in that discussion, because sometimes, you know, if somebody who's living with dementia can't can't communicate their wants and their needs and their desires, you know, quite rightly, you then go to their next, you know, to their family member, to their loved ones. Mm. But it's just so important to hear the voice of the person themselves. Um, yeah. You know, and I've just recently been into to one of our homes that were part of the initial strategy and just looking at their advanced care plans and the, the learning that came from the original strategy work is still there, you know, and the the amount of information and detail in those advanced care plans was incredible, you know, even down to things like um, the, the resident likes the smell of fresh roses, yeah. you know, so... At, you know, at the end of her life, we're going to put fresh roses in in her room. Um, she would like her bed to be so she can look out of the window and see the garden. You know, it's it's that kind of, of detail that before we did the strategy work and before we redesigned our end of life care plan into a proper advanced care plan, we didn't necessarily capture. But we've, you know, we we've got that now, and you know, now just. I'm just so proud of our our team who were part of that strategy um, that they've taken and they've retained that learning and and that is now having such a positive impact on on people as they you know as, as they near the end of their lives. It's that passion, isn't it, that people have that they they really want to make that difference for someone. And yes. like you said, yes. those tiny details which sound like Me nothing. Too. The difference makes the world that could difference. make, yeah, it's just yeah, makes the world difference. Oh, I can almost smell roses now as you've said that. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah, I just roses think of <laughs> Yeah, what a combination. <laughs> um, no, I think I think it is a it's a really special thing, and it's it sounds like such an exciting thing that is just going to grow and grow as well, which is is absolutely phenom- phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> Can't even say the word, which is yeah, it, it's fantastic. So you also brought attention to residents living with diabetes last year as well um, and worked with the international diabetes expert, Professor Alan Sinclair, to develop a set of guidelines and best practice framework when it comes to training for care providers. When did you first notice that this was an issue and how have the guidelines been developed since the pilot training last year? Um, Has it impacted your residents that are living with diabetes? And again, you know, diabetes is a another aspect of care that I'm passionate about. Um, diabetes has impacted my family quite quite significantly. Um, you know, so I was very aware of of diabetes and the impact it can have on people's quality of life. Um, so you know, so it was something when I was writing our policies, um, when I was looking at how we develop our care plans for people who are living with diabetes to make sure that you know that we were reflecting best practice. So when the when the opportunity to work on this national advisory panel with Professor Sinclair came along, that came via Care England, um, I was thrilled, honoured. Um, to be to be part of that work and it was you know it was a fantastic piece of work and I got to you know I got to meet some you know really really um, 
interesting and knowledgeable people in the in the field of diabetes. Um, what what we've done with the guidelines is we have just completed a big training program with our teams. Um, so we had we had specific training for our nurses, but also for our senior team and from for our carers. Um, I was lucky enough that Professor Sinclair came along to um, to support the nurses' training, um, you know, which which they were, which was very very valuable for them and which they they really enjoyed. Um, we're now again working um, in partnership with the company who delivered that training to to see how we can retain that learning and how we can take that forward to keep our team refreshed and to train new team members as they come on board. Um, <clears throat> I've seen, following that training, uh, a fantastic improvement in our care planning for people who are living with diabetes. Um, the, the level of knowledge and understanding of our team following that training is clear to see when you look through the care plans for residents who are living with, with diabetes. Um, we've also just introduced a diabetic foot screening tool because part of the training trained the team in how to monitor the diabetic foot, how to identify signs and symptoms um, of of possible problems, possible tissue um, breakdown. Um, so we've introduced this new screening tool that is now in use within, within the company, which has obviously improved incredibly the, the, the not just the monitoring of foot care, but the management of foot health. Because again, you know, if somebody's living with diabetes um, and if they are experiencing peripheral neuropathy and are losing the feeling in their feet, if that's not picked up early enough and they start to develop wounds in their feet, then you're going to have a whole range of problems. Mm. So it's about being able to to spot things quickly before they become a problem. So yes, yeah, so it's it's been it's had a an enormous impact on our team. And as I say the the partnership work we're doing with the, the training provider will mean that we can continue to to provide this training and continue to ensure that people who are living with diabetes gets the best possible care. Yeah, it's, like you said, it, it's another sort of side of things, isn't it, in terms of just making sure that any conditions that people are living with, they can still get that best quality of care um, from the, yeah. the staff that, that are trained in, in understanding what those issues are. And I think, you know, that's the, as, as a nurse myself, I think this is the thing that we do need to get out there, that nursing and care homes is so diverse. You know, there is so many different different conditions that you need to be aware of, that you need to have a handle on, that you need to monitor. You know, it is such a, a vast and varied job working in, in social care. Yeah, how do you, obviously with all these different things that, that obviously people need to be aware of and, you know, there's the policies, but also the, you know, the, the sort of the, the quality of care that you give run to people with different conditions. How do you engage your staff with kind of the training and that side of things? And how do you find that they take that on and, and kind of really deliver what you need them to? Yeah, that's, that's, a, really, that's a good question. Um, what we find is... Um, what we find is successful is obviously talking to the team. You know, you need to make sure what it is that your your team want to develop in. And from a, a clinical training perspective, that's what we've done. Um, you know, so we've made sure that the training we provide for the team is training that, the one, they've asked for, you know, two, that they're interested in, you know, three, has been successful in the past. Um, we always, always, you know, evaluate the training that's been provided to the team. Um, and we've got a fantastic learning and development team in Hallmark, you know, who will take that feedback and, again, will make sure that the learning and development opportunities we provide are based on people's feedback and on meeting people's needs. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, I think it is that. I think sometimes it is that. What do people really enjoy doing as well? I think when people have a, a passion for something and they really 
you know they're really interested yeah. in it as well so you know someone yeah. might be really interested in actually developing their knowledge of you know how to help people with diabetes for example and they really run with that once they've they've got that opportunity yeah. to to learn about it and that's it isn't it if somebody's got that passion and that interest the learning comes easy yeah and then that enthusiasm also then impacts on other team within the home as well yeah and it, it helps them develop as well i think doesn't it there's mm-hmm. You know, yeah. there's so many opportunities within within social care and, and within healthcare in general. And I think actually people that go into social care, they're doing it because they want to make that difference for people. They want to look after people, have that quality of life. But also they want to develop in their profession as well. So the more they can learn about different conditions, different ways to care, then that's developing them professionally as well as them, you know, given the, the quality of care that they want to. Yep. Yeah, Absolutely. So I think we sort of touched on it very slightly earlier on, but, you know, I think people often forget that when people are living in a care home, that's exactly what it is. It's their home. It's not somewhere they're just going to stay for a little bit. Um, So how does Hallmark create this environment, this homely environment for its residents across across the group? I think the the, the important thing is one culture, um, you know, so for our team, they, they know they work in people's homes. People don't live in their work, you know, so culturally our team understand that this is somebody's home and we always refer to it as as somebody's home. Um, Two, residents can do whatever they want with their rooms, Um, you know, so our rooms are beautifully furnished, you know, but if a resident wants to bring in her chair from home or her table or or whatever, you know, residents are encouraged to personalise their rooms as well um when we are when we're decorating our homes or refurbishing our homes um we do have an interior design team you know who do make sure that say for instance our our dining rooms are are inviting and you know easy to to access um our dementia communities um are are very very homely um we've We've always got items out for people to pick up and to look at and to use. And, you know, we we use a Montessori approach in our dementia communities, you know, which means that, you know, we have little notices everywhere saying things like, please have a drink or please take a sweet or please take a biscuit. Um, You know, these these hats are here to be worn and things like that, which really does encourage people to interact with their environment and to to become familiar with it as well. You know, and I think that the wayfinding is also important to to get to to support people to feel at home in the environment, you know, because if you come out of your room and you don't know where you're going, Mm. that doesn't feel very homely, does it? You know, so we're very, very keen on making sure that wayfinding is in place so residents can find where they want to be and what they want to do. And there's just so much happening um, in the homes as well. Um, you know, there's always there's always books and magazines and um, games and, you know, all sorts out for people if they want to use them. Um, but as I say, I think the important thing is, is that their residents' rooms that they can do, it's their space, they do what they want in their rooms. Yeah, I um I visited a Hallmark care home actually not that long ago and it was I totally second that. It was um the the residence rooms were all sort of done how they wanted and like you said, you know, a lot of them had their the the lovely furniture that you guys provide in it. But actually there was one that was being measured up. I think their um it was a new resident coming in and their son or daughter was um like a, a furniture designer, so they were like measuring up oh, to actually you know, build the furniture that, that the resident yeah. wanted within her room, which I thought was lovely because that will instantly make her feel right. Yeah, I'm at home. I know exactly mm-hmm. where everything is, and Absolutely. It, it was Absolutely. lovely. Because um, when you you know, and you think that a lot of people who are moving into care homes are are moving from their their family home, and a lot of people are moving from a big space in a in a in a house that they probably lived in for many many years yeah. into a room. So they they absolutely need their their loved possessions around them and anything that makes them feel more at home than you know 
they're welcome to to bring it absolutely yeah. it's their memories as well isn't it like furniture some people treat furniture as you know there's it's got special memories to it it might have been that it was owned by their family or you know they're a loved one that they might have lost might have absolutely loved that particular picture or whatever uh-huh. it might yeah. be it's just those little things yeah. isn't it that actually make give people comfort and they're good conversation points as well aren't they yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, if I'm in the homes, you know, and I'm going to, to talk to residents, you know, if they've got pictures or, you know, something in their rooms, it's a it's a good conversation starter. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it definitely felt lovely and homely when I went. And even the what I loved was the um, sort of the, the communal areas um, it felt very mm-hmm. like like a sitting room would. It was very yeah, much like yes. somebody walking into somebody's lounge, which was lovely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, the 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 most popular spaces are our cafe areas. Yeah. In the in the homes, they are always buzzy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think actually someone said, which was really nice when when I went in, that um, the residents quite often move the furniture around in sort of the lounge area as well, which again <laughs> shows you that they feel really comfortable yeah. and that it is yeah. their home. You know, yeah. they wanted to sit together, so they'd they'd moved all the chairs around and and whatever else. Which again, you you do that at home, so it. I think that just instantly shows that yeah they're comfortable yeah. in that in that space absolutely absolutely so just touching a little bit back to um to cqc so we know cqc and regulatory um inspection bodies are such a huge part of of the everyday in, in care organizations and obviously with your sort of previous um hat as compliance manager with them and with a number of hallmark homes under your guidance that have got a outstanding good or compliant cqc slash ciw rating what's your advice for other organizations when it comes to evidence and the quality of care they give to their residents and is there anything that you think often becomes an issue but could actually be quite easily fixed right take your first your second part of the question first things that could become an issue but are easily fixed. I think for me, the important thing there is listening. Listen to your residents, listen to to families, um, listen to your team. Because sometimes thing you know if people aren't happy with something and if you can sort it out early and you can address concerns as they happen then that stops them getting any bigger. Um, so I think having really good feedback processes is so important, um, you know, so that it's easy for people to, you know, identify if they've got any concerns, making sure that you're having family relative meetings, residence meetings, um, so that people know that they have got a channel by which they can have their ideas, their thoughts, their concerns listened to. And, you know, for me, that's, that really does make sure that you address something early before it gets to anything, anything bigger. Um, I think evidencing quality care, it's all about outcomes and impact on residents. So that's the key thing. Um you know, so we've spoken about policies and procedures, you know, and there are your foundation and absolutely there are policies and procedures that you've got to have. Um, and, you know, CQC, CIW give you a little tick for that. Yeah, you've got your policies and procedures, lovely. But it's about what you are doing, what impact that's having on residents. You know, and that is the key thing. So any kind of, of evidence that that you can can get that you can collect that actually shows the the outcomes the impact on residents yeah i mean it's it is all about them at the end of the day isn't it they are actually Absolutely. they're at the heart of it all Absolutely. whatever happens yeah 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 so i think for instance you know if you take like falls for for example you have a falls prevention management policy um, so you know what you're doing with falls. You have a falls risk assessment. You do falls analysis. You then make changes based on that analysis. And if at the end of all of that, you can show that the work that you've done has meant that Gladys has had less falls this month than she did last month, then that shows that what you are doing is having a positive impact on Gladys. Likewise, um, you know, being able to show that 
a resident is is gaining weight rather than losing weight mm. that's a good impact that's a good outcome for the residents you know so it's looking at how can we show the regulator that what we are doing is impacting positively on the resident mm. and, and it, that's what they're interested in yeah and it shows you understand the why it's happening as well which means you can then put something into place that stops it happening in the future yes yes absolutely absolutely so what's next for you what would you love to see um is there anything <laughs> policy wise that you would absolutely love to see implemented in the future I think for, for me, my main thing at the minute is is getting our end of life care centres of excellence embedded in in the homes where we're working and then being able to evaluate those outcomes and having more centres of excellence for end of life care within Hallmark as well. That that is, you know, that is something that that would be, you know, a dream that that we had. The majority of our homes and as I say we provide fantastic end of life care but to have more centres of excellence um, around around the company. Um, we also within my team have developed a number of what we call outstanding pathways which are formal pathways that are that our homes can follow to take a certain aspect of care or service delivery from compliance to outstanding. Um, and we want to develop more of them. We want to develop more outstanding pathways. We want to see more of our homes completing these outstanding pathways. And again, you know, talking about what we were talking about earlier about evidencing to the regulator, completion of the outstanding pathways in whichever care aspect or service delivery the homes are working on have built into them evidence of impact yeah so i want to see them being more widely used as well um and obviously i want more of our homes to be outstanding um <laughs> and in wales they are introducing their quality ratings um next year as well and um, their highest rating will be excellent so I want our homes in Wales to, to be excellent as well. That I mean that um the the outstanding pathways sounds like a very exciting um it project is. to be involved in, definitely. It sounds it like is, it's yeah. it'd be well mapped out as well, which is is really yeah. good for the homes. Yeah. So you know, so even the homes that aren't part of the end of life care centre of excellence work have got an end of life care outstanding pathway that they can that they can follow. And one of our homes is already starting on that end of life care um, outstanding pathway. I think the lovely thing about those things that you, you've just mentioned are all things that are sort of starting to happen as well like you've got some of your mm -hmm. your homes of excellence and i think it's yeah it's nice to see that actually you just kind of want to continue doing more of that amazing work mm -hmm. that that you're all doing and get it yes. get it wider you know across the bit across yeah. the country and i think you know because you know as, as, a, as a quality director you know you can have so many ideas and want to do a million and one things at once but it's important to to concentrate on something and get it embedded um you know so so once the centers of excellence have become embedded and have evaluated and you know we can get them out into work with other homes then i'm sure there'll be something else that'll pique my interest <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like working in marketing yeah there's always a million and one ideas but you just have to narrow it down <laughs> Right. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you know, I've, in in my role, I'm I'm so fortunate that Hallmark is such a innovative company, mm -hmm. and it's you know, Avnish, our, our chair and our shareholders, and um, and Iron, who's our, our managing director, um, they are all committed to providing the highest quality of care within Hallmark. You know, so. I'm I'm never having to push very hard. Mm. Um, you know, I push at an open door to <laughs> you know to, to take quality initiatives forward, which is you know just brilliant. Makes a huge difference that though, doesn't it? When when you sort of everybody's on the the same page and everybody wants to achieve the same objectives, if you like, it just mm -hmm. it makes things 
a lot simpler in terms it doesn't mean it's any easier in terms of the amount of work but it does make things simpler that you're not you know you're not kind of almost coming up against those objections straight away yeah yeah absolutely absolutely so Julie at the end of every episode we always ask everybody about their what the health tech moment so across all of our episodes we've had lots of random stories we've had the weird the wonderful the life change and the emotional um, so I'd like to ask you to share your what the health tech moment with us, please. <laughs> um, there's the, there's lots of, you know, I mean, you can probably tell through through our conversation that there's lots of lovely, lovely things that happen in Hallmark. And there's, you know, lots of, of lovely um, interactions that I've had with residents, you know, and with team. It's very difficult to to narrow something down. Um, I think probably the one that does stick in in my mind um, was a a resident who was living with dementia um, and I was was on the dementia community and talking to this lady, you know, and and part of dementia care is, you know, we want to, to support people to be involved in things you know, so laying the tables and putting out serviettes and things like that. So, you know, I was talking to this lady, you know, and asked her, did she want to help to to lay the table and and whatever? And she looked at me um, and looked me up and down and said, do you think I spend that much money to live here to set the tables? (laughs) (laughs) So that put me in my place. (laughs) And off she went back to her room. (laughs) She wasn't paying for me. She wasn't paying money to set tables. <laughs> oh, I absolutely so love that. Had a, you know, another lady who was living with dementia who had been a secretary in her, her, you know, in her working days. And the home had set up a, an office for her and she had a typewriter and a phone and, you know, and and going in and talking to her and she was doing the timesheets oh. you know so i was i was sitting there and she's going through the timesheets with me you know and it's just you know those moments are are diamonds you know they're golden moments you know when you see somebody actually um happy in their in their world um but but yeah you you do get the i think you get the the best interaction when you you know when you can spend time and interact with with people who who are living with dementia and be able to make those those connections you know i think that is you know that that is such a privilege yeah and i think i think that's a lovely way to to end this week's this week's podcast so thank you so much for joining us julie it's been fantastic episode I've loved listening to to all the fantastic work you you're doing at, at Hallmark and and the rest of the team as well I can't wait to sort of see more about about what's what's going to come over the the next 12 12 18 months sort of <laughs> sort of to say um and thank you to everybody for listening join us next week for another new episode don't forget to rate and subscribe and if you have any questions for us or our guests please email what the health tech at radarhealthcare.com. 